Well, I'm privileged to have the uh, opportunity this morning of sharing the word, and I want you to follow with me in the Bible today. We're going to 1 Chronicles chapter 11. 1 Chronicles chapter 11. I think it's important that we open the book and make sure that the preacher's not saying stuff that's not there. It's important that it's actually there, isn't it? Very important. This word's been on my heart for, for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I believe it's locking in with the things that Neil has been sharing with us. Firstly, about the covenant and more recent weeks about the, the battle that we're involved in. God is raising an army for now. The word that Ruth brought earlier was a spot-on word as far as I'm concerned. This is a now moment in God. It's not a tomorrow moment. It's not a yesterday moment. It's a now moment. It's a now moment. And God wants people who are ready now. He's not looking for people who will say, well, give me 20 or 30 years and I'll be ready. He'll come before then and you'll never be ready. He wants a now people, a people prepared, a people who are open. And you know what? He doesn't care how much background you've got. The old hymn writer said, the dying thief rejoiced to see salvation in his day. How many days did he have to serve the Lord? Only a matter of minutes. That was his now moment. So don't say it's all about yesterday. It's all about what you've got. It's all about your qualifications. It's all about this. It's all about that. It's about now in God. The background here is that we need to to uh, understand what God is saying to us in these days. And I believe that what Kendall's sharing on Thursday nights is also a now moment in God. I'll come to that in a moment. But the subject of understanding the times is very much on our hearts and on our minds. We sense that these are the days of the latter rains. And we talk about that, but I think at times we don't really understand what that means, the former rains and the latter rains. The former rains were the rains of sowing the harvest. Do you understand that? They were the rains that prepared the ground for the seed to go into the harvest, uh, for the, for the, to grow in time, time for the harvest. So when God talks about the former rains, he's talking about the day when the seed was sown. When he talks about the latter rains, he's talking about the day when the, the ground was prepared for harvest. Now in Christian terms, the former days were resurrection. The latter days were Pentecost. Resurrection prepared the ground for the sowing of a seed. Pentecost was a reaping, a harvesting. And the former rains and the latter rains are, are harvest rains. These are the days of the latter rains. These are harvest days. These are days of the great end time harvest. And we need to align with that and get ready. Or we're going to be passed by. We're just going to stand on the sidelines and watch the harvest being gathered in and wondering what on earth's going on. These are the days of the latter rains. And some would say the latter days of the latter days. To use another analogy, these are days for the army of the Lord to conquer new territory, retake old territory and accomplish a very great victory. 1 Chronicles 12, 22, we'll come back to 11 in a moment, but I don't know whether you've noted this verse before. You're going to note some stuff today that I hope that you will, will set you up for reading the word in a new way. In a moment, we're going to go to a chronicle. Why is the book of Chronicles called what it's called? Because it's a book of lists. Oh, they are so boring. 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 And yet tucked away them within them are certain gems. 1 Chronicles 4.10. Didn't the world go crazy about 1 Chronicles 4.10 some years ago? Huh? Did we? Yes. What about Jabez? Yeah. Tucked away in a chronicle, a list of names. And then there's a throwaway line about Jabez. Well, we've got some of those this morning. And I hope God does your soul good as we look at them this morning. But in 1 Chronicles 12, 2, it says of David that as his army gathered and came to him day by day to help him until it was a great army, like the army of God. A great army, like the army of God. When we go back to 1 Chronicles 11, we read this. Then all Israel came together to David at Hebron, saying, Indeed we are your bone and your flesh. 
Also in time past, even when Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord your God said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over my people Israel. Therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. And David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. Do you know David was anointed three times as king? Three times. I've had many people, we've transitioned in our ministry from conservative evangelical to full-on Pentecostal. And some people say, why, why, why do you need to do that? Why do you sing the song so many times? Why do you have to sing it over and over again? Why, why, why? Why do you have to go out for for laying on of hands so often? Why? Because I can't get enough. The great D.L. Moody had a couple of praying women who followed him wherever he went. And one day these two women came to him and said, Dr. Moody, there's a question we want to ask you. To us, you are the most anointed minister of the word of God that we have ever come in contact with. Why is it that you are so constantly asking God to fill you afresh? And Moody said, oh, that's simple, because I leak. Because I leak. Do you leak? I do. I need every refilling. Do you know the disciples only a matter of a week or so after Pentecost, it says in the book of Acts that they asked again to be filled. Why? Because they'd already leaked. Oh, God give us an understanding. David was anointed three times as king. The first, of course, was as the boy who wasn't even considered worthy to be in the presence of the great prophet. Oh, I've been some meetings where I haven't been considered to be in the presence of the great prophet, haven't you? (laughs) The prophetic word from the professional prophet who was making their living out of the word (laughs) didn't want to look at me. I was too ordinary. David found himself in exactly that situation. The great prophet was coming and there was no sign of David. He was still out with the sheep. And yet the Spirit of God was so on Samuel that when Samuel had looked at all the other boys, he came to this conclusion, there are great-looking boys. They are great-looking boys. But God's not looking at how handsome you are. God doesn't look on the outward appearance. God's looking on the heart. There must be another one somewhere because God hasn't identified any of these. All says his father. We've got the runt of the litters out there looking after the sheep. Well, bring him. And as soon as he came into the presence of Samuel, the anointing fell. The anointing fell. And what was he anointed as when he was a boy? He was anointed as king when he was a boy. When Saul died, the tribe of Judah came to David and said, we want you to be our king. David was living in Ziklag, which was in the Philistine area. And he moved to Hebron, which was a Levitical city, a city where the priests were living. And he moved to Hebron and he stayed there and he became king and he he ruled as king over Judah for seven years. He'd been living in Ziklag in the Philistine territory because he was a fugitive, a fugitive from Saul. And as he lived in Ziklag and as he lived in other places, as he lived in the cave of Adullam and in other places, some people came to him. And the only way to describe them is they were the riffraff. They were the no-goods. They, the, they were the dissidents. They were the criminals even. They were the defaulters. They were the, the nobodies. And our Bible says in 1 Chronicles 12 two, that band of dissidents became the army of God. Ruth was talking about a now word. I want you to get that in your spirit. If need be, we need to hear that word again. God is not the least bit interested in your past. He's interested in your now. And I am sick to death of the church being so caught up in the past. Everybody wants to know about somebody's past. Oh, I could tell you a story about him. I could tell you a story about her. God's not interested in the stories. He's interested in the now. Are you on fire for God now? Do you love Jesus now? Do you want to serve him now? If you want a record of my past, you'd say, I don't like that man. 
And I wouldn't blame you. But God couldn't care less. He's interested in now. And God's been telling me lately, I actually think you're all right. And I have to say, well, you must be the only one. He said, I'm the only one that matters. I was sitting in a meeting in London some years ago, and they served communion. And as I went to take the communion, I just lost it. I just broke down. And I heard God saying to me, Chris Pack, you may be on the other side of the world, but I know who you are, and I know where you are, and you are mine. I was in London because I was about to be promoted. And it was the start of moving out, not moving up. Because God was saying to me, I know who you are and I know what I want to do with you now. It was a now word. David moved, and we don't have time to go through all of this this morning, but David moved from the cave of Adullam into Ziklag and to other places and eventually to Hebron. And at Hebron, he, he was invited by Judah to become its king. And all he had as an army was this band, which the Bible tells us became 400 and then eventually grew to 600. But their circumstances of where they were living was such that he even had to make arrangements for his parents because the way he was living was too rough. It's an interesting story. It's in 1 Samuel 22. But this group expanded, but they were a group of malcontents and, and dissidents and, and dropouts and, and, and people who weren't wanted in mainstream. But listen to Jesus. I have no doubt that this is a prophetic image of the end time church. The end time church is not of the great ones. The end time church is not made by, is not to be populated by the people who are in the mega bucks in the kingdom. The end time church is made of ordinary people who are living in the now moment. Dissidents and dropouts and people with a history and people with a reputation, people like me. <laughs> And you, I think. <laughs> You've got a past too. And I'd be surprised if I didn't dig into your past that I mightn't like you either. And God couldn't care less. He's interested in now. And Jesus said in Luke 13, 29, they will come from the east and the west, from the north and the south, and sit down in the kingdom of God. And indeed, there are last who will be first. And there are first who will be last. I have a very dear friend who's gone to be with God, but he was a great poet in the Salvation Army and eventually became the world leader of the Salvation Army. And he wrote a song about that verse and he said this, they shall come from the east, they shall come from the west and sit down in the kingdom of God, both the rich and the poor, the despised, the distressed. They'll sit down in the kingdom of God. And none will ask what they have been Provided that their robes are clean. They shall come from the east. They shall come from the west and sit down in the kingdom of God. We are very, very, very people conscious. We want to know the past, but God wants to know our now. And that was in my notes before Ruth started prophesying. God wants to know our now. David and his mighty men, his ragtag bag of fugitives and dropouts, had sought refuge from Saul, been living in Ziklag and then moved to Hebron. It was not until after the death of, well, actually the murder of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, seven years after David had become king of Judah, that our chapter of 1 Chronicles 11 brings us to the point where it says, then all Israel came together. David had already been anointed king of Judah, but now the 11 other tribes came to, to, to David and they said to David, we want to make you king. And you know what they said to David? And this is the thing that fascinates me. Even though these 11 tribes, in a sense, had been in rebellion against God since Saul died, they came to David and they said, it's in your Bible, have a look at it. Verse 2, also in time past, even when Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in, and the Lord your God said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel. 
They said to David, David, there's a prophetic word over your life. We know that that prophetic word was that you will be king. Now it's time for you to become king of all Israel. And they anointed him king the third time. What an incredible thing. What an incredible thing. They anointed him king the third time. And David set about to move from Hebron to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a part of the promised land that had never been conquered. The Jebusites had ruled from their, their hill called Zion. <laughs> Nothing to do with God. <laughs> Zion simply means, and it's, a, it's an unsophisticated word, fortified mound. Oh, isn't it supposed to mean something special, Zion? It's come to mean something special. But it was just a fortified mound. And it was considered impregnable. In fact, the prophecies about Zion or Jerusalem or the city of the Jebusites was that the blind and the lame could defend it. And archaeologists tell us that the Jebusites had built what we would kind of call string puppets. And they set them on the wall of the city of Jerusalem. And when they saw an army coming, they'd just jiggle the puppets. And they'd let them know that the halt and the blind and the lame could, could keep them out of Jerusalem. And they were successful. Been a lot of talk in recent days about this end time harvest starting in the marketplace. David said, this city is not impregnable. Anybody who doesn't mind climbing the drain pipe, I've got a job for you. Send in the tradies. Isn't that right? Send in the tradies. Whoever gets up the drain pipe first, well, it was a kind of a sewer and it was a kind of a water overflow. It was a bit like the storm water tr drain. Anybody who can find a way through that drain up into Jerusalem and get the city, that person becomes captain of the army and Joab did it. Who was Joab? He was just one of the boys. Just one of the boys, <laughs> perhaps one of the tradies. <laughs> and he conquered the city through the drain pipe. Hebron stands for safety and security, a place where we are defended on all sides. David had to move his army from a place of safety and security to a place of conquest. I remember when we were at one stage looking around for a church, a friend of ours said, you ought to come to our church, it's the most comfortable place to hide. That church is on the Sunshine Coast and it's not all that far from here. It's a very comfortable place to hide, to sit back and do nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm only 68. I'm too young to sit back and hide. Oh, you poor old thing. No, 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 no. No, no, no. At 86, and you're still too young, Cyril, I'm sorry. At 86, Caleb said, give me this mountain. It's mine by right. I claim it as an inheritance. I mean, Cyril is so old that he calls Joseph Junior. <laughs> Just as well he drives modern buses, or if they had an old bus and an old driver, they mightn't go. But the modern buses make him look so good. But you understand what I'm saying? The word retirement is not in the Bible. It's not there. It's a, it's a conjured up idea. I, I, every now and then I complete surveys online and, and, and they want to know what your status is. I refuse to say retired. The best I can come up with is part-time. But I'm not part-time. I haven't got time for anything. You know what I mean? I'm not retired and I refuse to retire. If, if at 86, Caleb is only just getting fired up and if at 120, Moses has got all his faculties, what am I worrying about? Give me a break. There's time to move on with God. There's time to do stuff in God. And it's time to move from safety and security of Hebron to the place of victory and destiny, which is Jerusalem. The passage we've read suggests that there were five distinct steps for David, and I don't have time. I understand what Joseph goes through and what Kendall goes through. We don't have time to say all the things that God has given us, so I won't go. But there are five steps that David took. That I just want to focus on the last one. Firstly, there is connection. All Israel came together at Hebron and said, David, we want to be one. 
I want to say to you this morning, and this is a prophetic word. Hear me. This is a prophetic word this morning. It's said that one of the anointings that comes on my life in specific terms is prophetic preaching of the word of God. And I'm, I'm standing in that anointing this morning and I'm saying to you, unless you want to be one in this house, get out. This is a time for the people of God to be one, to be so connected, so connected that we are one. The second is commitment. The people of Israel said to David, we are bone, we are of your bone and of your flesh. Not just one, but so one that we are indivisible from each other. The DNA of the house is on us. And if you don't like the DNA of the house, then I invite you, find one where you do. Certainly there'll be one that's more comfortable. The third thing that we could talk about, and I'm just mentioning the points, the third thing that there was covenant. And all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron and David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. Covenant is a very deep thing. In the Old Testament, the way covenant was made was what's called the cutter covenant. It involved blood sacrifice. And the people came to David at Hebron and said, we are prepared to spill blood to be one. Merle and I closed a little church that we'd hung on to and we felt the Lord was saying it's time to close and we, we, we went to a church that we'd been part of some years ago and uh, it was nice. <laughs> and then we, the next Sunday we came here and we'd not been anywhere else. The sense of the DNA of the house is on us. The sense of what our leaders are leading us into is on us. Our children would love us to move to Sydney. We've just spent the week in Sydney and playing with the grandchildren is something special. We don't get the opportunity to do it all that often. And to have your little four-year-old come running and jump into your arms and tell you, Granddad, I love you. It's just, I'd love to feel it every week. But I had to say to my son during the week, I know how much you'd love us to come closer, but we, we are so happy on the coast and more importantly, we are so happy in church. We believe that we belong. I'm just reminded of the fact that the packs are taking over today in New South Wales. My daughter's preaching in Queensland. I'm preaching. Well, there you go. Covenant. And then commission. They anointed David king over Israel according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. And the fifth step is conquest. And I want to talk about that briefly uh, as we pull in this, after, this morning. In 1 Chronicles 11, in these early chapters, there are keys to conquest and victory. The enemy has a stronghold. Do you understand that? The enemy has a stronghold, but the enemy is like the Jebusites. He plays games with us and he pretends that he is invincible. He pretends that this is a, a destination that cannot be conquered and he'll get the puppets out and pretend to play games and taunt us. How many know that the enemy loves to taunt us? But the reality is there is a way of defeating the enemy. In point of fact, it's happened. But there is even a, a way in this day to remind him with strength and with power that, sorry, as our pastor loves to call him, hairy legs, you're done for, mate. You're done for. You're done for. You don't win. I've read the book. I know the end. I'm sorry to spoil if you're only partway through, but we win. We win. But the most important key to victory for David was in verse 9 of 1 Chronicles 11. So David went on and became great, and the Lord of hosts was with him. The Good News Bible says because the Lord Almighty was with him. The contemporary English version says because the Lord All-Powerful was on his side. And the message says God of the angel armies was with him. I love that. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You know that and I know that. We wrestle against principalities and powers. Invisible forces are arrayed against the church and the spiritual world. Unless the God of the angel armies is with us, we're a defeated foe for as far as the enemy is concerned. But if he's with us and directing us and leading us, we have no possibility of anything other than victory. 
God says that it's not a visible war, but an invisible war. I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you have a will to fight and win? Do you honestly? Do you have a will to fight and win? Do you have a will to fight and win? You see, I've forgotten what we used to call it, the war room. <laughs> what did we used to call it? The war room is a place where we ought to be. We ought to be involved in that hour of power if we've got a will to fight and win. It's on my heart this morning to say, if we've got a will to fight and win, we'd be tithing. Oh, don't get me into that, Chris. That's all legalistic mumbo-jumbo. Excuse me. I know of no other biblical standard if you want to put God first. And that's part of determining to fight and win. I believe that. I believe that categorically. It's part of determining to fight and win. Our Bible says in Psalm 78, 9 and 11, the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. The Ephraimites lost the will to fight. Have you got the will to fight? Have you got the will to fight this morning? It could be the Ephraimites lost the will and yet there was an incredible prophetic word over their lives and I'll read it to you in a moment. But it could be argued that many Christians today like the men of Ephraim have lost the will, the desire, the motivation to fight. But sadly the prophetic word over Ephraim was for greatness and victory. I don't know how much you take note of these things, but it's perhaps part of the funniness of me that I do. When Jacob was asked by his son Joseph to prophesy over his boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, Jacob took their hands and crossed them over and put his hands on the opposite heads. And Joseph said, Dad, you've got it wrong. This is Manasseh. He's the firstborn. This is Ephraim. And Jacob said, no, boy, I've got it right. I know, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great, but truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. That's not a bad start. And then later on when, Joseph was, when Jacob was blessing the whole family, he said this, Joseph is a fruitful bough. A fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him and hated him. <laughs> Understand that? The archers have hated him. But did Joseph win? Oh, yes. But his bow remained in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your father who will help you and by the almighty who will bless you with blessings of heavens above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, blessings your father has excelled, the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. That's not a bad prophetic word to have over your life. But in the day of battle, the Bible says, Ephraim being armed and carrying bows, turned back. Do you have the will to win? Do you have the will to fight? Let me ask you the question, do you have a will to fight and a will to win? We have received the prophetic word of victory and significance for the kingdom. We hear it again and again and again. And Ian and I were having a brief word the other day when Pastor uh, Neil came and spoke again into my life and, and Ian said, look, I've got the prophetic word. It's the same you've got before. <laughs> and I keep saying it's a new day, it's a new day, it's a new day. Well, i got plenty of time. I'm only 68. I've got heaps of time for a new day. But it's a now day. It's not a yesterday. It's a now day. The new day is a now day. It's today. Will we press into God's plan and purpose and desire or like the men of Ephraim, lose the will to fight? And the last thing I want to say is God has given for victory resources for victory and this is where I want to go to the Chronicle and this is what I finish with this morning. Go to 1 Chronicles 12. 1 Chronicles 12. And let me just read some of this. 
We note firstly, if we, when we get into this chapter, that the nucleus of David's army had joined him long before Saul had died and long before Judah had crowned David king. They came to David at Ziklag, that is, they joined him while he was a fugitive. They were of Benjamin, it says, Saul's brethren. They also were fugitives. Anybody who was not in Saul's army and came from Benjamin was a fugitive because Saul was a Benjaminite. And yet for David to have been joined by some of the men of Benjamin meant that they were fugitives and outcasts. We know why David was a fugitive, because of Saul's jealousy and rage. But why were the others fugitives? For reasons of crimes they had committed or conflict with authority or desertion perhaps? 1 Chronicles 12, 8, some Gadites joined David at the stronghold in the wilderness, mighty men of battle, of valour, men trained for battle, who could handle shield and spear, whose faces were like the faces of lions and were as swift as gazelles on the mountains. They were, they were like the bikies that you wouldn't want to meet on a dark night. The men of Gadites, the Gadites, outcasts. But God said, I can use them. Secondly, it's of note that some were Gadites who'd come to David when he was hiding in the Judean wilderness and, and in the cave of Adullam. And it says in 1 Chronicles 12, 16, then some of the sons of Benjamin and Judah came to David at the stronghold. And in verse 19, and some from Manasseh. Ah, even though Ephraim failed, there were some who hung on to the vision. Some from Manasseh defected to David when he was going with the Philistines to battle against Saul. 1 Chronicles 12, 22. At that time they came to David day by day to help him until it was a great army like the army of God. This army of malcontents and deserters and refugees and persons of dubious character had slowly but surely and very deliberately assembled together under the leadership of David until it was a great army like the army of God. And in 123, we're told these were the numbers of the divisions that were equipped for war and came to David at Hebron to turn over the kingdom of Saul to him who, according to the word of the Lord. And then we start to read and we say, boring, next chapter, please. No, we don't. This is a roll call of the great army of God. Verse 24, the sons of Judah bearing shield and spear. Well, they're pretty ordinary soldiers. God needs lots of ordinary soldiers. Do you feel today that you are ordinary? Well, good. We need ordinary soldiers. There's enough people who think they're extraordinary. We need some ordinary ones. People who can actually wield sword and shield. We need some. Verse 25, sons of Simeon, mighty men of valour, fit for war. They prepared themselves. They were ready to go into battle from Simeon. Verse 26, the sons of Levi, even the priests went into battle. Verse 27, a notable individual, Jehoiada, with a great personal following. Oh, I'm very special, David. Well, just get in ranks, boy, just get in ranks. Bring your boys and line them up. Just join the others. You see, there is no place in the army of God for the superheroes. There's a place for people who will get into line and fight. Verse 28, Zadok, a young man. Some of you young people. He is a young man, a valiant warrior, still living at home, the Bible tells us, but already a leader. Verse 29, sons of Benjamin, loyal men. Oh, we need some loyal people. I've been a pastor for, for 46 years. Merle's ordination as a pastor is 50 years in January. It's a long time, but we've met some disloyal ones along the way. God desperately needs some loyal ones, doesn't he now? Loyal ones. Loyal ones. You don't know a lot about them, but what you do know is they'll be there. They'll be praying. They'll be giving. They'll be at the meetings. They'll be at doing whatever's got to be done to make sure there's success in the house of God. Verse 20, 30, sons of Ephraim, mighty men of valour, famous men. Verse 31, here's Manasseh again. But there was Ephraim. Some of them had found the faith. Isn't that good? Verse 31, from Manasseh, chosen by name to make David king. Verse 32, sons of Issachar, and we could talk about this all the time, and sadly this is the verse we pull out of this list. 
because they had understanding of the times. And we need some thoughtful people. We need some people who've got the ability to analyse and dissect and, and, and read and understand and, and see through and hear the word of the Lord. But they're not the only ones we need. Do you understand that? We need these ordinary people. We need the people who can carry shield and sword and get out there. The people who might only have limited gifts, but they've got gifts that they're using. Verse 33 of Zebulun, men who were expert in war with all weapons of war. These are the highly gifted ones. Well, we need them too. We need them too. Of Naphtali, men with shield and spear, who spear very ordinary. The Danites who could keep battle formation. Oh, goody, goody, good. They can march. We need a lot more people forming up and staying in line, don't we? Don't we? Verse 36 of Asher, who could also keep battle formation. Verse 37, Reubenites, Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, armed for battle with every kind of weapon. Verse 38, all these men of war who could keep ranks came to Hebron with a loyal heart to make David king over all Israel, and all the rest of Israel were of one mind to make David king. Who was God looking for? He was looking for people who would just get into line and do it who would bring their weapons, whatever those weapons were, and do it. He was looking, he was looking for, Jesus told a parable about the, five, the man with ten talents and five talents and one talent. The one talent man buried his talent. God's looking for one talented people who will use that one talent. Who will use it? Merle and I have a bank account that has $15.14 in it. It's a savings account. Oh dear, we're, we're doing good. But it gets a cent of interest a month. Well, that's better than being in the credit card and doing nothing, isn't it? And Jesus said in his parable, if the man with one talent had only got some bank interest, that would have done. Well, if you've only got one talent, for heaven's sake, invest it in the kingdom. Invest it in the kingdom. Don't just sit on it. We are all mentioned somewhere in here. Oh, what a boring list. No, no, no. We are all mentioned somewhere in here. We are all mentioned somewhere in here. Even if it seems rather ordinary and insignificant, and all you can do is keep ranks and be loyal. But it is of this whole army. Not just those who seem more noble than others. It is of this whole army. It was said it was like a great army, the army of God. I close with this little story that I love. It comes out of the early days of the Salvation Army from a, a, a village in England called Folkestone. And in the early days of the Salvation Army, it was not uncommon to see the very wealthy as well as the very poor in meetings. And to this church regularly came, came a, a lady with her carriage and fours, Lady Beatrice. And one of the notable people in that church was... was the local drunk called Dirty Jimmy. And when it came on Sunday night to the pastor preaching the message for salvation and giving the invitation to come to the altar and pray, Dirty Jimmy was the first out of his seat and kind of rocked and rolled his way down until he fell at the mercy seat for prayer. And then with all the grace in the world, Lady Beastra stood up and made her way towards the mercy seat. And the captain leaned over the pulpit and he said, come on, Jimmy, move aside, make room for Lady Beatrice. And Lady Beatrice stopped him and said, it's all right, Captain. We're all seeking the same saviour. You see, it's not prominence that's the issue here. It's the now moment of redemption. It's the now moment of commitment. It's the now moment of falling in line and, and keeping in order. It's the now moment of using what weapons you've got for the sake of the kingdom. It's the now moment for being connected and commissioned and involved. It's the now moment for standing with the leaders of this church and saying, we're in battle formation behind you. God bless you.